The title of my message today is A Sign, A Promise, and A Meal. A Sign, A Promise, and A Meal. In the Old Testament, when God began to promise His people things, especially when the Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, they would wander through the wilderness, God would do something, and they would build a sign. They would, they would pile rocks on, one of, on, on top of one another. They'd make a pillar to the Lord. And every time they circled back to that moment, they would remember. They'd remember the faithfulness of God. They'd remember the goodness of God. And they'd remember the promise of God. They'd remember what God had promised them, that He would take care of them, that He would lead them into all um, the promised land and all that He had desired for them. And so I want to read to you a scripture, and it's taken out of John 13. Oh, sorry, I'm going to read from Luke 22, pardon me. Luke 22 and verse 20 this morning. It's the moment when Jesus is breaking bread with his disciples before he was um, to go and pray in the garden and ultimately go to the cross. And he breaks bread and he speaks about that, but then he speaks specifically about the cup and I want to read this portion of Scripture to you this morning. Luke 22, verse 20. It says this, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, Jesus spoke about this cup, and he pointed to the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. He said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Which is shed for you. Now, we have to, for a moment, try and extricate ourselves from the modern so today we put on a modern um, portrayal of Jesus being crucified and, and partly because we didn't have the budget to do it the other way. <laughs> no. But they did a great job. But we live in the modern and we, we, we sometimes, well, oftentimes don't have any idea of what Jesus was living through or what he meant or what he was pointing to and all those kinds of things. Later on, when, when, um, when Paul writes about us breaking bread, us taking communion as a church, he says we do so in remembrance of his death and we look forward to his coming. There's a sense of we anticipate something when we sit down to this meal. But in this moment, Jesus is not only pointing to the future, he's, always, he's also pointing to the past. And he's reminding these men, and, and I believe women, the other disciples that were there, they were, they were there in that room, and Jesus was saying something very specific to him. He's saying, this cup is the new covenant. Now for the Jewish people that were sitting there, they had a covenant with God. Remember David? Remember David, how he stepped out onto the battlefield uh, to face Goliath? Why? Because he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? A point at the fact that, that the Philistines didn't have a covenant with God. Circumcision was a sign of covenant. David steps onto the battlefield and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this man who has no covenant with the living God, defying the armies of the living God? He had a covenant. You know, for the Jews, they said, well, why do we need a new one, Jesus? We've got a covenant. Well, what's going on here? What are you trying to say? Well, very quickly, the understanding of a covenant was a contract, an agreement. If two people came into a covenant, they would make an agreement with one another. They would promise things to one another, and they would keep that agreement. The, the Latin word for covenant, I'm not going to say it because I will butcher it, but the Latin word for covenant means being united together. In the Old Testament, there was a sense of covenant was, you owe me something and I owe you something. Let's do this deal. But when they, were, when they were taking the Bible and translating it into the Vulgate, into Latin, they looked at that word and they gave it a different word. And they said, this is, a, this, is a, this is a coming together. This is being united together with. And what Jesus is saying to the disciples, he says, there is going to be a new agreement between heaven and earth. There is going to be a new contract between heaven and earth. And it's not going to be one where I just dictate to you. No, this is going to be a you being called together with me to live with me. This is the new covenant in my blood. You have to bear in mind, you must remember that man's malady was that he had been separated. His problem was that we had been separated from God. We were no longer with God like we were in the garden, in that picture of a temple and paradise. We had been separated from God because of our sinfulness, our rebellion, our wickedness, our insistence on doing things our own way. Adam and Eve, in their disobedience to God, by eating of that tree, plunged us all into the abyss of sin. Left dead in that place. 
There's not one of us, I was thinking about this this morning, there's not one of us that can claim that we are perfect. Or that we have never sinned. And in fact, I think we don't understand the extent of our sin, or the depravity of our sin, or the danger of our sin. This image came to me this morning. Could you imagine being tied, your feet um, cemented into a massive block of concrete? Chains around you, chained to that concrete, and then just dumped into the ocean. You and I might be able to hold our breath for a minute, or two, or maybe even three. I I hear that there are some people that can hold their breath for over six minutes, some divers. I want to tell you something. If the plunge into the abyss doesn't kill you, if you happen to land with that block of concrete and chain to that block of concrete, and by some miracle you are able to free yourself from that thing, you will die before you hit the surface. It, It doesn't matter which way you look at this thing, we're in trouble. Sin has left us broken and in more trouble than we can handle. And Jesus in this moment says there is a new covenant, a new agreement between heaven and earth, and things are about to change. Everything's going to be different. And he says, because of my blood. Because of my blood. So this, this moment points to the future, but it, always point, it also points to the past. And in particular, this would happen on the Passover, and in particular, it points to the moment when God delivered the Israelites from the bondage, from the slavery of Egypt. And Moses rolled into town with his brother Aaron and they were on assignment from heaven. They were on a mission from heaven to liberate the people of God. And God said to to Moses, Moses, Pharaoh's heart is going to be hard. He's going to resist you. And so God set about bringing plagues upon the nation of Egypt so that he could liberate the people of God. And the last plague reminds us of this moment and that's what Jesus is doing. And everybody in the room knew what Jesus was pointing at. Jesus was referencing a moment in the life of the Israelites where they were instructed to take a lamb and they were to slaughter that lamb. They were to offer that lamb as a sacrifice and they were to take the blood of that lamb after, um, after eating the meal and they were to take the blood of that lamb and they were to put it onto the, on the doorpost and the lintel of their homes. And the Bible says, God said a destroyer would come over Egypt. I want to actually just read you the scripture for a moment. If you have your Bibles, the team can go to Exodus chapter 12. Hmm. Don't worry, I'll do this. People say to me, why don't I read out of the Bible? Thank you. Because in my Bible, I can't do this and make it bigger, you see. But I can, yeah, that I'm, I'm sorted. Thank you, sweetheart. Exodus 12, 23. It says, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. Wow. You must say, hey, where's man? That is, that's horrendous. Why would God do that to the Egyptians? Why would he do that to the Egyptians? And maybe that's an answer for another day. But I want to say this. The Egyptians in the story represent, the, uh, represent our bondage. Represent those that bring us into bondage. Represent our enemy. And your enemy, the Bible is clear in the New Testament, your enemy is not flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And let me just say this. The devil has done a really good job of making your enemy somebody. When in fact, it's nobody but the enemy. I, I want to tell you that. The reality is, and I know probably very few nations have lived in the reality of that, like as in South Africa. We lived through a horrendous season of apartheid. And we were made to hate one another based on the color of our skin. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality and principalities and powers. And the Egyptians in the story remind us that we have an enemy, an enemy that wants to enslave you, an enemy that wants to destroy you, an enemy that wants to kill you. When you deal with Satan, it's like you're dealing with a snake. Now, I've got to preface this quickly before I say this. If you love snakes, I mean nothing by it. But if you're going to get rid of a snake, you've got to cut its head off. Don't entertain a snake. You've got to cut its head off. But the point is, is that God is saying, Jesus is saying in this moment, He's pointing back at this moment, He's saying, get ready. This new covenant in my blood is going to set you free from your enemy. It's going to liberate you. 
It's going to liberate you. And I can imagine maybe the smartest one in the group there. I don't know. John, Peter wasn't so smart. Thomas was always doubting. I don't know what the rest of them were doing. But maybe John remembered. Hey, Pastor Al. Maybe John remembered when Jesus stood up in the synagogue and began to speak from the, from the scroll in the book of Isaiah and said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty, to set the captives free. To proclaim the example, I forgot that, but explain the acceptable year of the Lord. The reality is, in that moment, Jesus was saying, I am going to be your great liberator. I'm going to set you free. This is going to be a sign. This is a promise to you. This is a promise to you that I will set you free. And on this day, heaven and earth are making a new agreement, and it'll be sealed in my blood. I want you to know this morning that God is your great liberator, He's your great deliverer. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. I want to take a moment and we'll end just to talk a little about the blood of Jesus. The Bible tells us, it's an interesting thing. Hey, Lord, why would you have it this way? Why would you have it be this way? But what we understand is the Bible teaches us that our, the life is in the blood. There's a whole lot of other things that are going on in your body. But if we, if we, if we drain you of all your blood, you will surely die. Why? Because the blood carries more than just nutrients and oxygen and all those kinds of things that carries your very life. And God established in the Old Testament that in order to deal with sin, in order to cover the sins of the Israelites for a year, they would have to take a lamb, a spotless lamb, a pure lamb, a lamb that has no sin, obviously lambs don't sin, and they'd have to sacrifice that, that lamb. And the blood of that lamb would be put on the, on the, um, on the mercy seat in the temple. And God would cover, that would cover the sins of the Israelites. It would cover them for one year. But the book of Hebrews tells us that His blood is better than that of lambs and bulls, right? And that He died once for all. Yeah. And so Jesus' life was in His blood. And His blood was poured out. His life was given as a ransom for us. So that you and I could have a blood transfusion, so to speak that you and I would receive His very life and live. Because the Bible tells us, we've been speaking about this over weeks, the Bible tells us that God doesn't make bad people good. He makes dead people alive. Why? Because sin left you dead. Without a pulse, without a heartbeat. And Jesus gave His blood so that you might be saved. That you might be delivered. And just like the blood of the lamb on that first Passover that was put onto the lintel and the doorposts, the blood of Jesus becomes a covering for you and I. It is the means by which God forgives us and saves us and redeems us, but it is the means by which we enter into His forever protection, His saving grace. Jesus covers you with His blood. And His blood washes away your sin. It's powerful enough to deal with our enemy, to deal with our sin, and to make us alive again in Him. Jesus is faithful to do this. I want to read to you one last scripture and we'll close. The hope of today is this. So this is a, a sign for us, a sign on a doorpost. There's the promise, and I want to leave this promise with you in John 14, 3. Listen to this. It says, if we go and prepare a place for you, this is Jesus, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The sign is blood on a doorpost, blood on our lives. His promise is that we were separated once from him, but no more. And that Jesus promises you and me, he says, I'm going away, he says, but I'm going to go prepare a place. For you, and so that where I am, you may be also. This is his promise. His promise to you and I is that he will come back. We look back to the sign and we're reminded of what's, being, what's happening. We look forward to this promise that he will come and receive us. And Jesus does all of this in one meal. And his body and his blood, the bread and the fruit of the vine, become that for us, a reminder to us. That God has set a sign. There are other signs in the Bible. We have the sign of the Holy Spirit, the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. We won't talk about all those things now. But I want to say to you today, today marks the beginning of our great deliverance and God's great saving work in our lives as He laid down His life and gave His life a ransom.
that His blood, blood might become the sign on the doorpost of our lives that we are His. We are His. We are loved and forgiven and we enter into His protection. Amen? Amen. Amen. Won't you stand with me this morning? So on this day, over 2,000 years ago, the cross was stained black by our sin, but also stained red by His blood. And today is a reminder that all those that will trust in Jesus and in His sacrifice, that He laid down His life, that He shed His blood, so that you and I, not by mistake, on purpose, so that you could be forgiven, that you could come into a new life, that new agreement between heaven and earth, that you could be included in that new covenant. I want to ask you just to close your eyes where you are. And I want to make this call this morning. If you are here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, you've heard this message today that Jesus died for you, that He hung up on that cross for you, He gave His life for you. Your sin, your sin blackened the cross, but His blood stained it red. And forever it's a picture of His forgiving grace toward you and me. And friend, if you are here today and you've never given your heart to Jesus, I want to ask you, I want to urge you to do so. If you're here this morning and that's you, your heart is racing and you just know, I need to give my life to Jesus. Where you are, would you just be bold enough just to raise your hand high? If that's you this morning, thank you. Is anyone else this morning? Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If you've raised your hand, I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. I'm going to ask you to add your heart to it. And I'm going to ask the rest of us to pray boldly with those that have raised their hands. And then for those that have raised their hands, would you please come and see me before we leave this morning? Let's pray. Would you pray this and say, Heavenly Father, today I realize my need to believe in your son Jesus that he died for me that he was raised from the dead for me today I give you my life I believe that you will forgive me and that you will wash me from all my sin and make me your child today I give you my life in Jesus mighty name Come on. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. So if I, if I could just chat with you after, that would be amazing. And for those that raise their hands. I'm going to pray and close and I'm going to let you go home. But I want to say this. Come back on Sunday for the final part. All right? Come back on Sunday for the final part. Let's pray and you can go home and enjoy your day. Father, thank you for the message of Easter. We thank you today that we remember Jesus hung on a cross and died for us. Gave his life a ransom in the most horrific way. Shed his blood so that we could be forgiven. And this morning it's been a pleasure to worship with your people and celebrate the beautiful name of Jesus. The wonder of the King of Kings. The Lamb who was slain. And we bless you Father. May today and all through today, may your spirit bring us wisdom and revelation as we think upon all that Christ has done. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen. Thank you for being with us, family. We'll see you on Sunday at 8.30.